Psalm 2, which are going to be our orienting reflection from Scripture to bring us into worship today as the Lord calls us um, with His words of grace. So, Psalm 2 says this, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. And in the knowledge of that good leadership of the Lord, the king over all creation, he greets us with grace, mercy, and peace. And we can greet one another in that same grace and mercy and peace. So let's take a few moments now to greet one another in the name of Jesus. As we're gathering back together um, to continue in worship, um, our grace and mercy that we're passing to each other in uh, these moments of relationship, um, they overflow into praise, uh, into praise of the Lord's name. And one of the things that we praise him for is for who he is, for what he's done for us. And um, who he is is the king over all the world, his whole creation. So we're going to continue as we sing in worship now. Um, to praise his great name for all that he is the Lord over and um, what that means for us.
Thank you that in the face of all sorts of political and um, other issues that come through our lives, we think of conflicts around the world, strife that happens in our own families and relationships, and all the other ways in which peace is not to be found. And in the midst of this, you, Lord, are King. So we ask that as we begin to listen to these words from Pastor Paul, that you would give us hearts that are receptive to the grace that's present in them, that our lives would be ready and willing to conform to these things. And we pray for Pastor Paul, that you give him the grace to speak with conviction, with earnestness about the truth of your word, and about the life to which you are calling us. And we trust that you're able to do this and so much more because we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And good morning. And a special welcome to those of you who are watching on live stream. This summer we're making our way through the story. 
in the book of Daniel. The first part has to do with his stories. The second part has to do with his dreams and visions. But we have a dream today in chapter 2. So I'm going to be reflecting on Daniel chapter 2. But I'm just going to be reading the first uh, 20 verses or so. So you can follow along on your phone or tablet or just listen as I read them aloud. And I invite you to join with me by standing in body or spirit as we stand before God in his word to hear these words from the book that we love. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. The astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king answered, You dirty dogs. I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officers, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. God's very word. Thanks be to God, and you may be seated. Experts say that we dream every night. We don't always remember them, mostly forget them. Some of them seem seem real, and others don't. Maybe you heard the dream of a businessman who is fighting a competitor, and an angel appeared in a dream, and would grant him one request, but he would give his main competitor double whatever he asked for. So the man asked to be blind in one eye. Oh, yeah. Bad dream. The Bible records dreams and visions that carry special special significance from God. And here, Nebuchadnezzar has one such dream. And the dream emphasizes the main point of the book of Daniel. And that is, the book of Daniel was written to give hope to every generation in all situations. 
Daniel's book is about hope for every generation in all situations. Daniel and his three friends had one thing that could not be taken away, we looked at in chapter 1, and that is their faith. And that God is never caught off guard by circumstances. He is not weak to respond. And the common promise throughout the book, whether it be in the stories or whether it be in the visions, is that God confronts the beasts of evil, sin, and death. And he will rescue the world and rescue his people and bring his kingdom over all. The only way that people can respond to such a great and wonderful God is to live by faith. Our faithful response to God is only because he has been faithful first. He never leaves, never forsakes, always cares, always supports. In Ecclesiastes, a book that was written about troubled times, we read this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We humans see with a limited vision. God sees all from beginning to end. So Daniel and his three friends had been taken captive and brought to Babylon for brainwashing. And yet they remain faithful to God. In spite of their circumstances, they knew God was faithful. God's faithfulness is overcoming every kind of violent beast, as this dream shows. So let's get into the story. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is so troubling to him that he could not sleep. And he had to know the meaning of the dream. Now there are some commentators who suggest that the king didn't remember the dream. Well, most of them are in agreement that Nebuchadnezzar remembered the dream. He remembered it. And being so shaken, he calls for his cabinets and advisors to help him. And he demands not just for the interpretation, but for the dream itself. Maybe you caught that. And the advisors said, well, we can't do that. And they insist on being told the dream. But the king does not relent. Tell him the dream. And then tell him the interpretation. This world and the dark spirits of this world have no answers. They have no wisdom. They distort the truth. They manipulate and they twist the truth, but they have no insight into true life. The king says... I've got you figured out. I know you've been giving me bad information, and the information is just to serve your own purposes and for your own goals. I've had enough. Tell me the dream, and I will know then that you have great wisdom and great power. If you're as close to the gods as you say you are, they'll tell you what the dream was. Well, the wise men refused the test. The king is convinced they have no divine wisdom. It's intriguing that the wise men give a line in there. The gods don't live here among humans, and yet that has been their claim all along, that they get divine revelation from the gods. They're shown that they are the people, the masqueraders. They claim they don't claim to be, but the king knows. He decides to wipe them all out, the conniving thieves. That includes Daniel. His three friends, they are part of this group as well. All the results from a dream. And in the dream, God exposes the rulers as the pitiful beings that they are before him. He is terrified. And he is convinced there is no wisdom on earth. But God has a plan. And God is unfolding his plan. And God wants to be heard. And so he's working his plan. In comes Daniel once again. Daniel is a young Hebrew teenager carried to Babylon in exile where he is retrained. They try to brainwash him. 
outside forces have brought him to Babylon, but Daniel and his three friends remain faithful to God. They're being trained to be the wise men, and so they are part of the order to put to death. And there is a knock at the door. Arioch, the commander of the king's guard. He has come for Daniel. Daniel asks what's going on, and so he is told. And Daniel responds that he wants an audience with the king. And that's granted. So he goes to the king and says that he has had no chance to talk to his god about what the dream is and the answer. And so the king grants Daniel one night, one night only, to inquire of his god the dream and the interpretation. If he doesn't have it by morning, Daniel and his friends would be killed. And so the first thing that pops into Daniel's mind as he returns home is prayer. He calls his three friends together and they hold a prayer meeting and they pray through the night. We're not told what their prayer is. Maybe because the focus is on the attitude of praying. Not just personal prayer, but praying together. The world says it's a sign of maturity to handle your own problems on your own. God says we're here for each other. We're here to bear each other's burdens, to pray with and for one another. The first result that happens from coming together to pray is that it says that God grants to them peace. Daniel, faced with the threat of death, is undisturbed and granted God's peace. But Nebuchadnezzar, the one who issued the order, is unglued and frantic. A contrast between the fullness of God and the bankruptcy of Babylon. And God answers their prayers. And so we get to the answer. Daniel returns the next morning to the king with confidence because God has granted their request. And having encountered God, he comes with courage and strength. Here is the dream. There was an image. An image of an incredibly huge statue that gave a sense of awe and wonder. This unique statue was not made out of one substance, but out of many. The head of gold, the chest of silver, a belly of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of clay. These metals deteriorate in value and strength from the top down. There is a downward progression. And then there's a stone, a stone that comes out of space, a stone not made by human hands. And this stone comes and it hits the statue and it turns the statue into dust. And the dust is blown away by the wind. The stone continues to grow. And it grows until that stone becomes a mountain and it fills the whole earth. This, O king, was your dream. No wonder he was disturbed. God also gave the interpretation of the dream. And here it is. The statue of many metals and substances represents the powers of the world. Some of the metals are associated with certain world powers, but they also represent, the statue represents all powers of the world, earthly authorities, not just nations and kingdoms, the powers that stand against God, all tarnished by sin, all in rebellion against God. Nebuchadnezzar is told that he is the head of gold. Babylon is a world power unlike anything else, seemingly indestructible. And yet other national powers would rise up and displace them, yet each one inferior to Babylon. Against all these world powers and all the powers that stand against God, they will be smashed, smashed to bits. God himself will smash the world powers, 
each one in God's time, for he is the stone. That stone which represents the kingdom of God come down to earth will one day grow and fill the entire world. God will one day be recognized by all for who he really is. That day will soon come. And Nebuchadnezzar is so moved that here is someone who can tell him the dream and the interpretation. He falls on his face before Daniel declares how great Daniel's God is and that Daniel's God is greater than all the gods of Babylon. Daniel is elevated. He's elevated to a ruling place in Babylon. Only the king is above him. And Daniel asks that his three friends be elevated to assist him in his service. So all four become rulers in the power of Babylon. That's the story, the story of chapter 2. So what are the takeaways? What are the applications? Here are some. First of all, a reminder that God is faithful. He shows that he is the one who is fully in control. He's in control of the vision from beginning unto end. And Daniel and his story is just one of a list of stories and books in our book of how God remains faithful and good. And it's only because God is faithful that we have hope for the future and grace for the present. Throughout the early chapters and then in the later chapters, the common promise is that God confronts the powers of the beast, of evil and sin and death. And he wins. He will rescue the world and he will rescue his people and his kingdom will be an eternal kingdom overall. And when God's answer comes to Daniel, Daniel's first response is to stop and to praise God. Because when God is at work, there is no room for human pride. Only opportunity for praise. And God's greatness, when people get a glimpse of it, it leaves the powers of the world in awe. The king falls down before God. He sees himself as that handful of dust before him. The most powerful person in the world back then, worshiping our wonderful God. God's faithful. He is faithful. I think secondly in this story, Prayer is a great privilege and a great task. Prayer allows us to tap into the powerful possibilities and the power of God. It is through prayer that Daniel connects with God, and it is through their prayer that Babylon sees the greatness of their God. It's all because of prayer. And for many, prayer is not that important. Often an afterthought. And we see prayer as simply talking about our problems and talking about our complaints. But God has decided the way that he brings about his kingdom is through the prayers of his people. That's how he has decided to work. That's key for God, the prayers of his people. A third takeaway from the story is that God provides best in our weakness. He provides best in our weakness. God asks us to trust, to recognize our complete inability to help ourselves. Someone's ready to kill Daniel, and there is absolutely nothing Daniel can do. And that's how we explain our salvation. We realize the truth that we cannot help ourselves. In fact, we need someone to save us from ourselves because our disobedience and arrogance is done against God and being a holy God, he must punish it. And when we realize that we cannot save ourselves is when we ask God to provide for us. And he did. He sent his son from heaven to earth to show us the way 
to die for all of our wrongs, and then Father God raised him on the third day to say that all of our sins are forgiven when we ask him. When we realize we can't save ourselves when we are weak, God provides. And that stone in the king's dream, not made by human hands, that smashes the statue into dust. Peter, in his first letter, chapter 2, tells us that stone is Jesus. Chapter 2. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Messiah Jesus came to ultimately take down all rival nations and powers and establish his kingdom. And he did that. When Jesus came, he came and he established his kingdom, a kingdom that is growing. And one day, that kingdom will be here in its fullness, in its totality. And everyone from peasant to king will recognize Jesus and who he is. God provides the best in our weakness. Maybe you remember Pastor Robert. He was here last Sunday, one of our missionary partners, and uh, shared what God is doing in his life and their ministry and how discovery is blessing him. Uh, well, you know, we, we're trying to gather support from other area churches in addition to Discovery, the deacons have responded just tremendously. And uh, just recently we got another check from another uh, local church's uh, group of deacons. And they gave me the check. And I thought, well, I can mail him the check, but I think I'll just bring it on over to him. So this was yesterday afternoon after I was uh, done with things I needed to do to finalize today and play in my yard a little bit. I go over to Pastor Roberts, and I knock on his door, and uh, we have a cup of tea together, and I hand him the check. And he says, two minutes before you knocked on the door, I had this bill on the table before me, and I had no idea how we were going to pay for this bill. And then God sent you with a check. See, we want stories like that, but we don't want to put ourselves in a position of that kind of vulnerability. But that's when God works his best in our weakness. And lastly, our response to God is faith and obedience. And I say this for last because primarily God is faithful. He is the one. Our response of faith and obedience is only because he is faithful. So here is a teenager. Daniel is a teenager who takes this incredible step of faith and obedience. And he does so because he knows his God shows up, regardless of what happens. So the Bible tells us the things that are temporary. And the Bible tells us the things that are permanent. And that ought to straighten out our priorities and how we invest our time and use our efforts. And the word pairs that we use to connect deeply and to follow intentionally and to serve justly are reminders of those priorities of how God calls us to live our lives. So let's make sure we have him in our life and not just a part of our life, but in the center of our life. To allow him to be that stone and to allow that stone to grow within us. That his kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you once again for uh, your great love for us. We thank you that you are faithful and supreme. That you have brought the victory over all the powers of sin and evil and death. 
And though circumstances may confuse us, not only in our lives, but in the world, we know you are faithful and you are the victor. And how we bless you for being a great and wonderful God. Because you are the great victor and your kingdom is here and growing, we pray for our world to be at peace. We lift up the wars going on in the world, the wars where reigns and institutions are fighting their own people, where a country is taking on country. We pray for an end to this violence, to the destruction, an end to the suffering and the death of human life. And Father, we pray for our community and the needs we have. We pray for Gail and Gil and Joe and Pam, that your grace and goodness will abound, that you will provide for them the needs they have, and for Dan and Rosemary and Sue and Dale and Dot and Nikki, that you will continue to, bro- to provide special grace. On this day, we thank you for our dads and for those who have served in our life as fathers as leaders, as influencers. We bless you for them, and we pray, Lord, that you will give a blessing to those around who are serving as fathers and dads. We lift up those who are struggling and those who are recovering. Ralph from his knee replacement surgery and Roberta with her foot and her leg. We pray, Lord, that you will grant the healing. For those who are struggling in other ways, Struggles with finances, with parenting, with caring for aging parents, with extreme brokenness. We lift up our families to you. We lift up our neighbors that you would shine your light of grace upon them. We pray this day and this week for our neighbors on Coleman Street that you would give an extra blessing to them and they would know the blessings come from you. We lift up our missionary partner, ASJ. We pray, Lord, that you will bless and protect their leaders, whether they be here in the States or in Honduras, and that you will continue to use them to join with the growth of your kingdom in bringing justice and grace and righteousness to the corners of the world. We thank you for your grace. We pray you will booster our resolve to live lives of love and kindness so that you will honor. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone agreed and said, Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing of our only king, uh, who is the king over all creation and um, of the rule which he has over all things. Oh, you're 
in the face of the things that seem to challenge God's kingship, the ways in which um, other kingdoms seem really powerful and cause us anxiety in some ways. Um, And for someone in a position like Daniel um, to trust that Babylon was not um, more powerful than the Lord requires a certain settledness in our conviction that God is actually the king of all things. And that means that we sometimes need to pause and recognize who it is that we think is actually in charge. Um, And so what we're doing here for a moment now is pausing and looking at our own hearts and seeing what it is that bubbles up in terms of anxiety, concerns, maybe things that we're still thinking about, maybe there's a sports thing we're concerned about. I wouldn't know about that. Um, but something in our lives is um, maybe causing us to wonder if the Lord is truly the king over all things. And this is a chance for us just to bring that to God, um, to recognize some of those ways in which we haven't trusted in his lordship, and to trust that he's gracious and ready to welcome us as not just subjects, Um, but friends. And so let's take a moment here and um, we'll read a portion of Scripture that speaks to this reality. The Apostle Paul, speaking to Christians, followers of Jesus, who lived in the center of power, where the emperor of the world lived. Paul's writing to these followers of Jesus, and he says this to them in Romans 13. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber 
Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. What he's talking about here is living in God's kingdom and waking up to the reality that the day of the Lord's coming is nearer now than when we first believed. Our day of salvation is near. So as we think about that, as we meditate on that, we're going to sing this song, uh, Revelation song, and that's going to be our closing song in this time of worship.